It feels as though ever since The Force Awakens was announced in 2014, the internet has talked about Star Wars nonstop. Star Wars. Star Wars. Star Wars. Star Wars. Star Wars. Star Wars. The Last Jedi. Oh, wow. Very cool. Even though I've been a fan of the original trilogy since I was very young, I've avoided talking about Star Wars on this channel because I felt like this franchise has been praised, criticized, and speculated about to the point where I couldn't possibly add a single thing to this unending dialogue that hasn't already been said. But then I saw Solo, a Star Wars story, and it broke me. <sighs> so yeah, let's talk some shit. This video is going to be primarily focused on the series from The Force Awakens on, so in regards to the original trilogy and the prequels, I will be brief. Star Wars, Episode 4, A New Hope. It's great. Star Wars, Episode 5, The Empire Strikes Back. Wonderful. Also my favorite in the entire series. It has all the good shit. Yoda, I am your father, cliffhanger, robot hand, fucking ad -ats. There's a reason this one tends to be the fan favorite, so if you tell someone how much you love Empire, don't be surprised when you hear... I know. Star Wars Episode 6, Return of the Jedi. Mostly great. I'm not sure how I feel about all the Ewok stuff as an adult, and Boba Fett goes out like a bitch, but other than that, it's a perfectly good conclusion to the original trilogy. Overall, the original trilogy, it's great. Good evening. Whoa! Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. No. Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. Worse. Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. The best in the trilogy, but still, no. Hey, you're being very dismissive of the prequels, and that's unfair, because a lot of people like them. Well, Sunny Jim, I'm sorry, but I don't. And considering people's opinions on these particular films tend to be coarse and rough and irritating, I will not bore you with the finer details of mine. And there are plenty of videos that rip these films to shreds at length, so you can go watch one of those. But as far as this video is concerned, let's move on. I personally feel that the continuation slash rebooting of this franchise could not have had a better start. At the time it came out, I was determined not to get my new hopes up that it would be any good while also not being too cynical. The latter proving especially difficult considering I couldn't even go into the produce section without being marketed to by a fucking orange. But thankfully I was pleasantly surprised. The Force Awakens, in my opinion, was really good. Its pacing is excellent. At no point during this film did I feel like it dragged or wasted a minute of its two hour and 16 minute runtime. With the exception of a couple of CG things that made me go, eh, the film looks great too. The universe felt very tangible and real, which is something that I really loved about the original trilogy and felt was lacking in the prequels. There wasn't one new character that was introduced that I didn't enjoy. Poe was very charming, Rey was charismatic and likable, Finn gave the stormtroopers some overdue humanity, and Kylo Ren was a profoundly interesting villain. I really appreciated the fact that they revealed Kylo's lineage fairly early on in the film and didn't attempt to make it some sort of twist. It helps to develop his character more quickly, and in knowing his lineage and what his childhood may have been like growing up during a war, we're able to understand why Kylo Ren would be so emotionally troubled that he would ultimately turn to the dark side. Oh, and I really liked BB-8. He's a good little boy. There are two complaints about this particular film that I'd like to address because I feel like they are the most common. The first one being that this film is far too similar to A New Hope, and yes, aesthetically Jakku is very similar to Tatooine. The scene where Han Solo takes Rey and Finn to meet Maz Kanata is very clearly a nod to the Maz Eisley cantina scene, and of course we have the blowing up of the enemy's super weapon at the end. This is the only thing that I kind of had an issue with because it really didn't feel necessary and it was the most on the nose New Hope-esque thing in The Force Awakens to me. I feel like maybe they could have rearranged a couple of things story-wise so that they didn't have to blow it up so soon in the series. 
But overall, I didn't find it to be a huge detriment to the film, and as far as people criticizing JJ for quote, remaking A New Hope, I feel like that's kind of unfair. First of all, this is not just a continuation of a series, it's also the soft rebooting of one. Not only because it had been almost 10 years since Revenge of the Sith, but because the prequels had become so utterly despised that J.J. Abrams was given the responsibility to make a film that would essentially fix Star Wars. Disney and Lucasfilm were basically like, hey J.J., you are the new hope. No pressure, don't mess this up, thank you. So I completely understand him playing it safe in some areas in order to be certain that the film would feel like a Star Wars film. And other than the handful of similarities it has to A New Hope, it really overall does its own thing. The second criticism I have heard very frequently is how is Rey able to use the Force right away with no training? That doesn't make any sense. Well, actually, it does, and they explain this during an important scene in The Empire Strikes Back. During his training with Yoda, Luke attempts to pull his ship out of the swamp and fails. This is followed by Yoda showing him that it is possible by pulling the ship out himself in a way that seems almost effortless. Then they have this exchange. I don't... I don't believe it. That is why you fail. It's the motherfucking Eagle Double G. Snoop Dogg! Rey is the embodiment of hope and belief. Even though her family abandoned her when she was very young, she still believes that they're going to come back for her and she has been diligently counting the days until their return. Unlike Luke, she has had to learn to fight and fend for herself pretty much her entire life. Sure, Luke's aunt and uncle are brutally murdered in the beginning of A New Hope, but before that, Luke had a pretty okay upbringing. But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. Ray doesn't have the luxury of whining about power converters and has to scavenge for what little she can so that she can survive. Without her hope and optimism, she would have nothing to live for. So when Han Solo tells her that everything she's heard about the Jedi and the Force is true, she's very receptive to it. And even though her experience when touching the lightsaber makes her afraid, she's ultimately able to overcome it in order to get herself out of trouble. Though Luke does become a powerful Jedi, his development as one is much slower because of his lack of faith in it early on. Rey has never been able to afford to be pessimistic, so harnessing the Force comes much more easily to her because of her openness to it. You will remove these restraints and leave this cell with the door open. But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters! Oh, Biggs is right. I'm never gonna get out of here. Not unless you can alter time. Until you drop your weapon. Harvest or teleport me off this rock. So yeah, I really liked her character. Really enjoyed the film, and then a year later, I went to go see Rogue One and was like, "What just happened? What is this?" Rogue One takes place directly before A New Hope and follows the story of the rebels who steal the plans for the Death Star. Since this film is technically a prequel, we kind of know how it's going to end before even watching it. We know that they successfully get the plans for the Death Star and probably all die in the process. So this film's primary responsibility is to make us fall in love with these characters so that by the end of the film, we'll have become emotionally invested enough to where it doesn't matter that we knew where the story was going. But. I don't feel as though this film was successful in that regard, unfortunately. With the exception of K2SO, the rest of the characters were surprisingly flat and I really didn't feel a connection with any of them. There are some things that this movie does well, most of which is in the third act, but I feel as though its most important job was making these characters who we've never met before interesting, and they just didn't do that. Forrest Whitaker's character didn't even need to be in this movie. He's set up as this rebel who's gone kind of crazy later in life and is going to be a massive obstacle slash antagonist that the main characters are going to have to deal with throughout the film, but no, they just kill him off almost immediately. I feel like they didn't even know what personality type to give the pilot character, so they just have Forrest Whitaker violate him in a very hentai-esque way in order to extract information, so he's just kind of touched for the rest of the film. And that's his whole character. Jin and Cassian have basically the same personality, only Jin has more backstory considering she's the main character. I would have liked to know more about Donnie Yen's character because I like the idea of this really talented fighter who would have been an awesome Jedi if he had had the opportunity to have been trained. But they don't develop him or his best friend very much, whose character trait is being Donnie Yen's best friend. 
My favorite character of the Rogue One crew was by far K2SO, played by the wildly underrated Alan Tudyk, who needs to be in more things because he's precious. But anyway, he's the only one in this film with any real charisma, and he manages to provide some genuine comic relief here and there, like this part where he describes my feelings about this film. I thought I told you to stay on the ship. You did, but I thought it was boring and you were in trouble. His was also the only death that made me genuinely sad. Though there are some great visuals in this film, there are also some that are just downright distractingly bad. Most notably, the CGI Tarkin and CGI Leia. You cannot tell me that some random dude on Instagram can make himself look identical to Kim Kardashian by just using basic contour, but Disney and Lucasfilm can't find someone who looks and sounds relatively like Peter Cushing and take him the rest of the way with their vast makeup budget. Especially since Mon Mothma is played by a different lady than she is in Return of the Jedi and no one was upset or distracted by it. So I am baffled as to why in the same film they made such drastically different choices as to how to portray these two pre-existing characters. And as far as the CGI Leia, I just don't understand why on earth that was necessary. If you absolutely had to show her at the end of this film, there are so many different ways you could have shot that to where it didn't even need to show her face. Princess Leia is so beyond iconic, we know what she looks like just by seeing the dress and the hair. You could have continued to just shoot her from behind. You could have made the lighting dim where maybe we only see a silhouette of her profile as she delivers that final line of the film. You could have even done that over the shoulder reflection shot that we got with Tarkin earlier in the film considering that was kind of the only part where he looked okay. But no, on this road trip, we are driving straight through the uncanny valley. Now before the Rogue One fans come after me for being too harsh on this film, there are some things that I really did like about it. I thought the idea of Jin's father, Galen Erso, intentionally building a weakness into the Death Star was really clever. You really admire his character for never giving in to the Empire and risking everything in order to help the Rebellion. All of the scenes with Darth Vader were super entertaining, especially when this film decides to turn into a straight up horror movie for a minute and we just see Darth Vader slaughter a bunch of dudes in a hallway. It's like old boy, only not at all. One of the reasons I think this film was so well received upon its release is that it has the audacity to turn into like a good movie in like the last 30 minutes. Things really pick up as the characters are getting closer to their goal and the rebels unleash an all out attack on the empire. We get that really nice sequence of the two ships crashing into each other and disabling that shield. It looks great and things are getting done. And it almost makes you forget that the entire rest of the movie prior to this moved at a snail's pace. Though it does have a few redeeming qualities, this film just overall feels thrown together, despite the extensive rewrites and reshoots that were done in order to save it. However, after recently listening to an interview with Tony Gilroy in which he briefly talks about his experience with being brought onto this project, I'm glad they did those reshoots. Gilroy was brought on board after they had done a director's cut to provide some notes, additional writing, and act as a second unit director on the reshoots and he describes what he walked into as, quote, a mess. They were in such a swamp. They, they were, needed you. Well, they were just in so much terrible, terrible trouble that all you could do is, 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 is improve their position. So yeah, instead of a disappointing film, we could have apparently ended up with a complete dumpster fire, earning Rogue One a solid could have been worse out of 10. <laughs> So although The Last Jedi should be next on the agenda, since up to this point I've talked about each film in order of when it was released, I want to save it for last. Not only because I have far more to say about it than I do about Solo, but because of the recent resurgence of hate it's been getting. I mean, it's gotten to the point where Kelly Marie Tran has been driven off of social media because of the excessive harassment she's been getting over her character Rose. You guys are so mean. It's crazy. Anyway, I will certainly get into all of that later on, but for right now, let's get the most recent Star Wars story out of the way. Solo, A Star Wars Story is about a slightly younger Han Solo and is the most financially unsuccessful Star Wars film to date. Many have blamed the divisiveness of The Last Jedi on Solo doing poorly at the box office, but I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. First of all, the trailer sort of 
gives away the entire film, and considering this is a prequel, people are far less worried about spoilers than they would be if it was one of the films in the main series. So I think people were in far less of a rush to go out and see it for the sake of avoiding spoilers, especially if they were disappointed in The Last Jedi. Then the reviews began to come out, which were primarily poor, and this was likely the final push for some that were on the fence about whether or not to spend their money on a ticket to just skip this one. Oh, and the news that Phil Lord and Chris Miller were fired over their creative differences with Lucasfilm so far into production really rubbed people the wrong way. Unfortunately, if I had to describe Solo, a Star Wars story, in one word, it would be boring. Like I said before, the trailers pretty much cover everything. There's some action once in a while and a couple people betray him. One would assume that the point of making a young Han Solo movie is to have him experience some sort of arc that turns him into the Han Solo we meet in A New Hope, but he really doesn't have one. He still has the same personality, he's just slightly less good at things. Oh, and Solo isn't actually his real last name, as we find out. As Han is enlisting in the military, an officer asks him what his family name is by asking, who are your people? Han replies by saying, he has no people. So the officer names him Han Solo because he's by himself. What makes this even more odd is that it's mentioned later in the film that Han did know his father, so presumably he does have a family name, or maybe his dad didn't have a name either? I don't know. The only two scenes that I genuinely liked in the film were the two card games between Han and Lando. The first is used to basically introduce Lando and establish what type of person he is through his cheating. The other is basically used to end the film and to show how Han acquired the Millennium Falcon. These scenes were small windows into the film I wanted to see, one in which Han and Lando's relationship is maybe the main focus. Maybe even have Han be the one who betrays everybody in the end. He doesn't have to be perfectly likable because he's already had his arc of becoming a good guy in the original trilogy. Han Solo is kind of an asshole and always has been, and everyone's always been fine with that because that's his character. The idea of a young Han Solo film has always been strange to me because Han isn't old in A New Hope. Harrison Ford was only 33 at the time and Alden Ehrenreich is currently 28. Not much of an age difference at all. Han makes a comment in Solo that he's been running scams on the street since he was 10. So why on God's green earth didn't you make that movie? Overall, this movie isn't terrible, it's just lame, which is the opposite of what a Han Solo focused film should be. And I don't think audiences were craving a solo, solo film as much as Disney thought they were. I wish I had more to say about it, but I just don't because I feel so disconnected from it that I don't even have the motivation to be annoyed. It just made me feel tired. I have nothing against Ron Howard, and I believe that he did the best that he could with what he was given, but I really wish I could have seen the Lord and Miller version, because by all accounts they were really trying for something different. Woody Harrelson pretty much summed it up when he stated, I love their style of working, but they wanted to do it different than the way the powers that be were used to Star Wars being done. So, that's that I guess. Star Wars fans are an interesting group, and are different than many other fan bases for one specific reason, at least from what I've observed. Take the term fanboy. When I hear it, I automatically think of someone who is so obsessed with something that they like every aspect of it unconditionally. I think of people who are hard pressed to find a Marvel or DC film, believe it or not, that they don't like. They wear their t-shirts of whatever it is that they're about to watch to the theater, clap every time a thing happens, and leave the theater all smiles no matter how someone's CG upper lip may look. But when I hear the term fanboy in association with Star Wars, my mind just automatically pictures someone who just fucking hates Star Wars. I don't think that necessarily means that that's the majority of Star Wars fans, but they're certainly the loudest group. I thought that The Force Awakens was divisive, but The Last Jedi came out and everybody just lost their minds. Ryan Johnson ended up getting death threats, and for what? Making a film that you don't care for? I have several more issues with this film than I do its predecessor, but overall it's certainly not the utter disaster that many have made it out to be. 
at least not in my opinion. If you didn't care for this film, that's perfectly fine. There are certain aspects of it that are frustrating and I can see how some of those things would taint someone's overall experience with it. I would be the biggest hypocrite in the world if I acted like it wasn't okay to hate a movie, especially after my Annabelle videos. But there's a big difference between poking fun at or criticizing a piece of art and flat out harassing everyone who was involved in it for quote, ruining your childhood. I've been a Star Wars fan my whole life and I get being frustrated with it. I remember going to see all the prequels and being disappointed every time. And before that, going to the theater for the 20th anniversary of the original series and seeing all of the out-of-place CGI that George Lucas thought was a good idea. And worst of all, realizing that not only were they going to keep changing things every time they released it on DVD, but that I didn't even have the option to watch the originals the way they used to be anymore. I have my fingers crossed that since Disney just bought Fox and now have full rights to the original films that they will do the smart thing and re-release the original trilogy in its original form. But my point is, I get it. I get Star Wars pain as much as anyone. It's been a rough couple of decades. There's a documentary called The People vs. George Lucas that goes deep into all of this stuff. Star Wars has had a really strange relationship with its fans for some time now. And again, there's nothing wrong with criticizing a film. My channel and countless other ones do exactly that all the time because we love talking about movies. But a lot of the criticism I've seen for The Last Jedi has been far from constructive, to put it lightly. So before I continue talking about the angry mobs surrounding it, let's talk about the actual movie, finally. This is hardly a hot take, but the entirety of the Canto Bite sequence makes this film feel like it comes to a screeching halt. Most of the attempts at comedy just fall flat to the point of cringe and it just doesn't work. Tonally, it's just bizarre. So of course, the supporting characters need something to do, especially since we've just introduced a new one and Finn hasn't really experienced an arc since he decided not to be a stormtrooper anymore in the previous film. We need to put him through something that pushes his character to decide whether or not he wants to be part of the rebellion. Because that's really one of the only things that comes out of this entire storyline, considering the fact that the whole codebreaker thing just falls through and they end up getting betrayed anyway. We also need to spend some time with Rose's character since she's just been introduced and needs some development. But unfortunately, I feel like this supporting storyline is a bit meandering and doesn't feel like it carries much weight in the overall film to the point where Benicio Del Toro's character didn't even really need to be in it. As far as Rose goes, I wouldn't call her a bad character as much as flat and underutilized. They introduce this character who is devastated about her sister's death, tech savvy, and is profoundly dedicated to the rebellion. But they don't really have her do anything that impacts the overall story aside from preventing Finn from sacrificing himself. So I wish they would have just dropped the whole codebreaker thing entirely and had her and Finn figure out how to disable the enemy tracking device themselves. Also, I wish they would have had Rose express some anger towards Poe for getting her sister killed. I know a lot of people think that the lesson being pushed through Poe's storyline is that you should just blindly follow authority, but I really didn't interpret it that way. His impulsiveness gets a lot of his own people killed in the very beginning of the film and he shows no remorse for it whatsoever. So I think Leia was right to slap him in the face and demote him and for Holdo to exclude him from the plans because he's proven himself to be pretty high risk. I'm really not sure why he's such a dick in this movie. That's Admiral Holdo? Battle of Chiron Belt, Admiral Holdo? Yonta. Not what I expected. Why? Your comatose general is a well put together older lady. What are you talking about? He goes so far as to organize an all-out mutiny before learning that there are consequences to your actions, and sometimes it's better to be more mindful and strategic rather than going in guns blazing and getting a bunch of your own soldiers killed. Maybe we could have had Rose guilt him a little bit about her sister's death so that he could have come to this conclusion without becoming a straight-up war criminal. Overall, I just feel like the supporting storylines could have been handled a little bit better. The other aspect of this film that felt a little off to me was some of the humor. Not all of it, but there are certain jokes that feel a bit out of place. The Force Awakens was tonally consistent and the moments of humor fit in nicely, but in The Last Jedi some of them feel weirdly inappropriate. Like, for example, when Rey hands Luke his lightsaber. I know that they were going for a surprise slash laugh when he abruptly tosses it over his shoulder. 
but it just feels kind of strange. If they wanted to do a misdirect, I wish they would have just had him approach her as if he's going to take the lightsaber from her, but instead he just gently closes his hand around hers, indicating that she keep it and gently touches her shoulder as he walks away. Yeah, just some of the jokes and dialogue just didn't land for me as well as they do in The Force Awakens. Let's go, Chrome Dome. I was so relieved that Rey's parents were nobody. I was so speculation fatigued over people saying she was a Kenobi or that she was Luke's daughter based on the fact that they looked at each other for a long time. I was praying that they wouldn't take the fan bait and make her related to some other major character. It never made any sense to me. Parents that would leave their little girl on a desert planet to probably get killed sound like assholes. And guess what? They were assholes. It also ties into the idea that the Force belongs to everyone and you don't have to be descended from a Jedi to be Force sensitive. Just like the little kid at the end who Force grabs the broom. Though watching Luke drink some titty milk while making deadass eye contact with Rey was deeply unsettling, I enjoyed the scenes between the two of them for the most part, and learning Luke's reasons for wanting the Jedi to end. He has a great point when he says the idea that if the Jedi die, the light dies is vanity, because it is. The Jedi favor the light side of the Force as the Sith do the dark side. Neither of them own it, they just have an advanced understanding of how to use it. The Jedi had a lot of rules that they were required to live by in order to prevent themselves from being tempted by the dark side. Most notably, they aren't allowed to marry or have any contact with any of their family. They basically aren't allowed to love or dwell on any emotions in general. This ancient practice of suppressing emotion simply wasn't sustainable and the Jedi Council ended up being overthrown anyway. Separating the light and dark has only ever caused conflict, so it's time to move forward and embrace both. Everyone's acting is pretty much solid across the board, the standout performance of course being Adam Driver's. There are scenes where he has to emotionally dial it up to a 10, and that can be quite difficult without getting into Nicolas Cage territory, but he does an awesome and believable job. I really enjoyed all of the scenes between Kylo and Rey. I find their dynamic and progression of their relationship very compelling. I like that they're expanding upon the capabilities of the Force and how it foreshadows Luke being able to project his image across the galaxy. I know a lot of people didn't like this, but first of all, Jedi have always been able to project themselves from beyond the grave, and nobody ever had a problem with that. Plus, the effort literally kills him, so it's not as if there were no consequences to using that much power, but of course, Star Wars fans have to overreact to every single thing. This isn't what happened last week! Have you all got amnesia? They just cheated us! This isn't fair! He didn't get out of the cock a duty car! I like that Kylo turns on his master and kills him because it further develops his character and Snoke was never that interesting of a character to me anyway. And the lightsaber battle following this looks amazing. I really love the choreography. In fact, this whole movie looks amazing. I feel like this needs to be addressed because some people seem to think that you aren't allowed to give a film with this budget any points for looking nice because it should be a given. Also, some people almost look at it as a negative because they assume its intent is to distract you from the fact that the film may be flawed in other areas. But I have to give credit where credit is due and the cinematography in this film is more than deserving of praise. Solo had money and it didn't look good at all. The lighting and color correction were really bad to the point where I felt like I was watching Shadow Puppets the film. So great cinematography doesn't just happen, it's a talent and I will compliment it when I see it. Like I said before, I personally have more issues with this film than I do with The Force Awakens, but it's by no means a bad film. It's still pretty good, so it's difficult for me to wrap my head around the anger towards it. Obviously, when you make a video like this, you open yourself up to be criticized for your opinions. When you shit on a movie, you have to be prepared for people who liked it to strongly disagree with you because you kind of have it coming. But this is the first time I'm actually more nervous about the response I may get for praising a film. And I don't think I'm the only one. There's a reason why so many people that have made videos praising this film have chosen to use the title In Defense of The Last Jedi or something similar. People are enraged at this film to a level I just can't understand. Kelly Marie Tran having to delete her Instagram because of the level of harassment she was getting is just so sad. The reason I've titled this video Downhill, A Star Wars Story is not just in reference to the state of the actual films, but 
the fan base as well. Because nothing Star Wars has ever done has warranted the hysteria that the more toxic side of the fan base has displayed. And for anyone who thinks that Kelly Marie Tran stepped away from social media because she can't take, quote, constructive criticism, then I don't know what universe you live in where Instagram is just loaded with well-worded constructive criticism. An actor's entire job is constructive criticism. Unless they are a very high paid seasoned actor that somehow has creative control over the project they're working on, their entire workday consists of being told, that wasn't right, do it again. So Miss Tran stepping away from the onslaught of internet harassment in order to protect her mental health was both the wise and mature thing to do. It blows me away that people actually have stated that Rose is a worse character than Jar Jar Binks. This hyperbolic contrarian nonsense just makes me want to do that slapstick anime shit where I just fall over from disbelief and you just see my legs sticking up in the air. As does the new Twitter page at RM The Last Jedi that's apparently wanting to remake The Last Jedi, and I quote, provide Disney an opportunity to course correct with the Star Wars franchise. Oh my god. This actually got roasted pretty hard on Twitter by people far funnier than me, so I won't go into it, but feel free to look up this whole debacle if you want a good laugh. So as to the future of Star Wars, it's hard to say what's gonna happen. Due to Solo being deemed a box office flop, the other spin-off films that were in the works have reportedly been put on hold for the foreseeable future. There have been rumors that Kathleen Kennedy may step down later this year, and as for episode 9, Colin Trevorrow has now been fired from directing the film and J.J. Abrams is his replacement. And it feels like very recent history repeating itself. J.J. Abrams is once again carrying the burden of not only directing a Star Wars film, which is difficult enough, but also being put upon to repair Star Wars as a brand. To make a film that'll somehow make up for The Last Jedi being so divisive and for Solo's poor performance across the board. Thoughts and prayers, pal. I do not envy you in the slightest. As for me, when episode 9 comes out, I will be there, as I always am. As will all of you who have devoted all of your energy to shouting from the rooftops how much you hated The Last Jedi. You guys know you want to see how this thing ends. Don't lie. So until then, may the Force be with you. Thank you for watching. Thank you.